Welcome to the HR on the Offensive podcast, brought to you by Lace Partners. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the latest HR on the Offensive Podcast. It's me, Chris Howard, joining you as I like to do and always do every Thursday that we release our podcast. Today's podcast is an interesting one. I've got a CPO from the creative industry in to talk to myself and my wonderful co-host, which I will introduce. I'll introduce our guests first, but let's do the co-hosting first. Debbie, you all right? Hi, Chris Howard. I'm all right. Oh, you went full names there. I went full names. I've gone formal today. Oh, right. OK. We well, don't go too formal because, you know, we like okay. to have a bit of fun on this podcast. A bit of forced fun. Yeah. yeah, a bit of forced fun, which I'm going to drop on you guys both in the fundamentally different question in a minute, though. But um, just as a bit of a framing exercise, we ran a campaign last year, actually, called the Employee Experience Revolution. You can check it out on the Lace Partners website in the Insights section under the campaign if you want to. But in it, there was one podcast where we got a chief marketing officer along to talk a little bit around, you know, what are the types of traits or things that HR professionals can be learning from marketing people. We've also done some stuff around finance and, you know, there's always ways in which you can take the best bits from certain functions and apply them to your own role. And so today's guest, we had a we had a pre-conversation about this, but I thought it was quite interesting to talk about the creative industry because it is a an interesting and a dynamic industry, but we still wanted to get a HR person on. And to do that, I'm going to introduce her now after my waffle. It's uh, Elaine Grell, who is the Chief People Officer of Ogilvy. Elaine, how are you doing? Welcome to the pod. Oh, thank you very much. Doing really well. Thank you. Yeah, it's lovely to have you on. Now, I'm going to hit you both, you and Debbie, with the fundamentally different question. But before we do that, let's do some intros. So can you tell our fabulous listeners just a little bit about yourself and then maybe a little bit about Ogilvy? Yeah, sure. So I'm, as you said, the Chief People Officer for Ogilvy for our EMEA region, which is Europe, Middle East and Africa. I've actually spent most of my career in travel, hospitality and leisure. I did a number of years at British Airways. I then went to Intercontinental Hotel Group. And then after working for two global, very mature businesses, I went to lead the people function for a scale up, which was uh, all things fun and scrappy and um, a real contrast to the type of career I'd had previously. And then when it was time to move on from there, I was really looking for something that would be a blend of the two. And Ogilvy fits that. It's a business that's very, very people focused which coming from travel, hospitality and leisure is also about people and experiences. So it was a nice transition into a new industry. Um, Ogilvy itself is a founder-led agency. It's a global agency and it's led or founded, I should say, by David Ogilvy 75 years ago. In EMEA, we operate over 25 consolidated markets. We've got just under 5,000 employees in various locations. And Ogilvy, it's a marketing communications business that has five businesses within it. So we cover advertising, PR and influence, consulting, health, and also our Ogilvy One proposition, which is all about technology and relationship building. And our ambition, it's a big ambition, and it will be, being a marketing agency is to impact our clients and people is to inspire our brands to impact our people and the world and the way we do that is through something called borderless creativity where we say it doesn't matter where the talent is as long as the talent meets the capability or the skill when the two of those things come together that's where the magic occurs and then that's where we can really create impact and value for our clients and we are a creative network and we're very proud to be uh, named as Cannes Lions Network of the Year. It's a huge accolade for us. Really proud of that. It's lovely. And this is where I'm quite, I'm really excited to get into the detail of this in working. Because you've just described working in, in very fast paced industries, but whether it's the travel leisure side, but also I guess scale up as well, very fast paced. Yeah. I love that borderless creativity piece. We're going to get into that. We're going to delve into kind of some of the flexibility and bits that it gets onto that. I'll probably let Debbie go with the first question, but I get to ask my fundamentally different one first. So I mm-hmm. read an article on the BBC website. Debbie, I'll, we'll let Elaine give her a few seconds to think about this, <laughs> but um, I'm going to hit 
present you with it first. So on the BBC website, there is an article that talks about a man who, poor man, lost his emotional support alligator, was stolen from him. Mm. It was all returned. <laughs> so the story was happily ever after. But just to kick us off with our fundamentally different question, if you could have an emotional support animal, what would it be? Thanks for that. That's uh, a nice, easy one to kick us off with. I mean, for those who have seen me before on video calls and on HR on the Offensive Live, they'll know that in the corner of my office is a crow, often mistaken as a toucan or some other kind of penguin item, but it is a crow and uh, obviously named Cheryl. And I, I always have Cheryl with me. So she's always there in the background looking out for me. She was originally bought by an ex-boyfriend a long time ago who thought that she was a toucan and bought her as a toucan of his affection for me. So I think probably Cheryl, my crow, is going to be my support animal. Just don't tell my husband. I love that. Also, <laughs> I love the cheesy joke. Well, I suspect that's probably why that boyfriend was no more quite quite soon <laughs> afterwards. But Elaine, well, go on. what's your emotional support animal before we kick off to the serious stuff? I think it would be an owl because they're very wise, aren't they? And, you know, quite often when things come to me, it's because they're difficult or complex and it's something that needs escalating. So it's often also things that are confidential. So you can't just talk to any and anybody. And there's just something about an owl that makes mm. me feel that they might just keep all my secrets, but they'll also have some very wise counsel for me, which I can then pretend was my own wise counsel and I then give it to someone else. <laughs> and as yours is Cheryl the Crow, maybe I'd call man Ozzy the Owl. Maybe that will work. Yeah. <laughs> And I can stroke I love that yours feathers is a, as well. I can stroke its feathers. Just yours is a much more sensible response than mine. So very credible, Elaine. Thank you for bringing some sense into the conversation. So I just want to come back on some bits you said in your introduction, Elaine, because it was it kind of just rings a lot of bells in my in my brain to find out more around this kind of borderless creativity. So could you just talk to us a little bit more about what that means, but also how does that present itself? What would I what would I see and experience that would kind of play into that? I think the main thing is it's not setting limits on your thoughts, on any ideas that you may have, how you may go about solving those ideas, where you may be inspired or stimulated with your thinking. It's not putting any constraints around you at all. And it really delves into the power of working with other people so where can you really collaborate with each other to get the best of another person's thinking their ideas their challenge without feeling that you've got to think of it all on your own or it's just the team that you work within who else might there be in other teams other disciplines other markets that may be able to help you and solve the problem that you're working on or come mm. up to, come up with a way to make your idea even better and even greater than what it was when you started I mean, it's really interesting and it's I can see how that would really kind of foster that creativity. I wonder what that means in terms of things like your policies, your processes, because those can sometimes be the things that constrain people, right? That we're, you know, we want to be creative, but we've got to get the sign off or we want to be creative or we want to do things differently, but we've got to go through sort of different permissions or fill out the form. And how does that kind of play out for you? Yeah, and I have been in this industry now just coming up to two and a half years. So it's been a lot of learning for me in that there is a lot of flexibility within the business and you have to be very agile in the way in which you respond. So as you know, leading people processes and practices, it's really thinking about where do you need to have things that are non-negotiables and have to be done in a certain way? And where are the things where you can have more freedom and flexibility, even if there's a framework, where, where do you give that freedom? So so some things like non-negotiables are the things that are really needed to engage your people, retain them, keep them connected to the business. So we have a process called our careers conversations process. So things like setting clear goals non-negotiable right we want everybody to do that it's important that people know what they're working on why they're working on it and feel like they're making a contribution regular check-ins non-negotiable talk to your people see how they're doing where do they need support what are they doing well where do they need celebrating and really trying to understand who you have in your team and with that structure in place then all the things around it can be much freer with how you get things done 
Yeah, I really, really love that. Funnily enough, Kathy, Actoplo, our CEO, and I were having a conversation. We did a live stream at the time of recording. We did a live stream this morning, sort of our time, although the listeners obviously will have to go back into the archives to see it. And we, we were talking about hushed hybrid, which is another buzzword which has come out. And this idea that you've got managers that are kind of just doing hybrid, but not necessarily always sticking to policies and and structure and there's a real balance that needs to be struck between this idea of kind of you've got to enforce the policies but you also you need to do that you need to have structure within that business but then still being able to get that creativity which i really love the question i wanted to ask you was more around types of individuals that are successful in the creative industry and is there any kind of if i was to ask you kind of about leadership styles and your experiences are there any types of individuals that tend to work really really well with in the creative industry that you come across that you could just see, yeah, that person is perfect culturally for the way that we operate as a business, but also the industry as well. Yeah, I think what's really important to me is the diversity of the teams that you have and the diversity of the leadership that you have. When I think about leaders and the role that they play, which I think is fundamental to the success of any team, The leadership style that works really well is one uh, where leaders have a lot of curiosity about the people in their teams, who they are, what motivates them, what drives them, what are the things that may prove more difficult for them? Where do they need adjustments so that they can be their best? Just what's going on with them, like what's going on with them at work, what might be happening out of work, just so you've got a better picture of the total human being of who you're working with. And then that curiosity as well is how does that play outside of the office environment? So how are you really curious about what's going on in the world, what's going on in culture, how is society developing? And as a marketing agency, clients come to us because they expect us to be ahead of the curve with trends and new ways of doing things. You can't really do that unless you yourself are putting yourself out there and continuously learning. And learning agility is super, super important. And then also from a leader, empathy. So these are really like inclusive leadership skills, really, that I think work really well here. Mm -hmm. But being empathetic to the ways, you know, how people feel, being more in tune with their behaviours, their actions, what that might mean for how productive and how happy and engaging they can be at work and how you can be empathetic to people with different viewpoints to you. Can you encourage really robust, healthy debates and dialogues? Because that's how good ideas generate, by really going there and challenging each other and unpicking things, not taking things at face value. How do you really encourage that debate? And one of the things we've worked on a lot, particularly across our EMEA region, is something which we called our connected culture for creativity and we looked at what what makes culture what makes culture across our region what are the things that are most important and we were really keen to recognize the role of the leader but also recognize the role that we all play because I'm a real believer that culture is built by everybody it's not a top down or a bottom up thing it's something that we all contribute Mm. to and build so we focused on what does it mean from a leadership perspective how we lead does it mean for the workplace environment how do we make sure it's fun it's engaging we looked at how we collaborate with each other how we can connect people from different communities where they may not normally have that natural connection made, how we connect with society, and then how do we make sure that we can really build diverse teams. So it's multifaceted, I guess, is one. Yeah, it's interesting as well, Elaine, because you there's a few things you allude to in that where the experience you want to create for your employees mirrors the experience you need to create for your clients. So, right. you know, when you talk about curiosity, when you talk about empathy, when you talk about diversity, so it's kind of that playback of what's happening internally that can then reflect externally. And we see that sort of as a bit of a rising trend with some of our clients that we work with is kind of making sure that mirror is clear because if you are not curious at work to your point will you be curious to your with with your clients to your clients so i think that's an interesting kind of take on it and we sort of see that and exploring it but the other the other thing that we sort of are exploring at the moment is around people management people leadership kind of capability and and how mm-hmm. to really bring the best people leaders into that kind of role so i'm a bit i'm quite interested in you talked about some of the qualities but how how do you find those people how do you access that and how do you sort of measure and 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 assess that to bring the right people into those leadership roles internally or externally 
Yeah, I think it's spending enough time with them when you're looking for people, whether it's through a formal interview process, whether it's at a networking event, it might be somebody you're talking to then, you might not have an opportunity then, but you remember them for something later. It's recommendations from the people that you work with, people you've worked with before. And it's about talking about the things that are important to us and seeing how it resonates with that other person. Do they contribute to that notion? Do they disagree with it? Which is fine too. Like just what is their point of view? And what I've found probably most challenging in trying to find leaders of this type is where they're quite comfortable in operating in spaces that might feel uncomfortable. Because, you know, as leaders, the more senior you get, the more you're expected to know everything. So you expect people to be able to come to you with an answer and you can answer. (laughs) But we're increasingly in positions where we don't know the answer. And we may have a point of view that actually differs to the point of view from the person that we're talking to or the people within our team. We've been doing some work with our leaders to help them navigate some of that. You know, how do they center themselves? How do they really know who they are, what they stand for, what they're comfortable with. How do they accept the areas where they're less comfortable? And then how do they find strategies to help them navigate through that? But I think it's a constant, constant process. And what's really interesting about that is what we're exploring is how, you know, the traditional leadership training, I'm doing those annoying air quotes for for the (laughs) listeners at home, that that traditional kind of pump people through a a management training program and they'll come out the other side as brilliant leaders. And actually what we're trying to understand a bit more is what actually are the kind of skills or capabilities or behaviours that they need? So it's interesting to hear you talk about some really different things, right? It's not, you know, how to do a disciplinary process. It's not, it's not even having powerful conversations, which is kind of the next Mm -hmm. level up, but it's a level up from that around, you know, leading in ambiguity is kind of what I think you're describing and, and understanding where you play in that. I mean, the world is a challenging place for us all. You know, we hear all the stats. It's, you know, it's fast moving. It's ever evolving. It all sounds really, you know, sexy and, you know, the world is so exciting. But when you're in the middle of it and you feel it, and then as a leader, you've also got to be able to give direction and guidance and coaching to others. It does put a lot of pressure on you because not only do you have to be technically competent in whatever field you lead in, but you also have to be very emotionally competent as well. Mm, yeah. And you, you may find that for many leaders, and that's not necessarily the area that they've proactively invested in themselves in the past few years. And what about just sort of generationally, what kind of differences do you see through your organisation in terms of some of the different generations? I mean, I'm, I hesitate to talk about them sometimes because they're such sweeping generalisations, but equally they are, there are some quite big differences across the board. Do you see that and does that play into how you sort of people plan or how you manage or engage your people? Yeah, there are definitely differences. There are also similarities across the generations. So you're right, we we have to be wary of not generalising whole generations per se, because at the root of it, we are all individuals. And what we are finding is that the younger generations are more open generally in saying what they want, what they need. They are less tolerant of waiting for things to change. If they don't see change quick enough, and that can vary for each person, then they will potentially walk and go somewhere else. But when I look across EMEA, and I was just looking at the sort of demographics across our region, it was really fascinating to me to see how the generations are playing out in different markets. So in the UK, for example, you know, we've got a lot of millennials, but across, other than that, it's quite even numbers between younger people, people Mm. at the more experienced end of their career, versus some of our countries where, like some of our African countries, for example, nearly 50% of the demographics graphic in that country is younger than 25 and then you think wow that's a whole (laughs) different way of looking at things so I love difference because to me that's what's exciting and makes keeps me energized with my role but I'm always conscious as well of thinking okay there's a lot of difference but also where are the commonalities and they're the things that we have to get right for everyone if you get it right for everyone or even if you just look at a core group of people If you get it right for them, the halo effect is immense. But likewise, if you get it wrong, the halo effect is very, very detrimental from an impactful way as well. 
a negative yeah. impact. You were just talking there about those commonalities and Debbie obviously asked the questions about the generational stuff, but I'm interested to get your view from an industry perspective. What differences have you kind of noticed in terms of leadership styles in the creative industry, perhaps compared to you mentioned travel, leisure, scale up? Is there any kind of bits that you've been able to pluck out that you've been able to say, yeah, that is a commonality that seems to exist amongst creative people? You know, it's really interesting. You think about the the creative agency that we have here as i said we've got lots of different businesses and we've also got lots of disciplines within that so yes we've got creatives as you might think of a traditional creative but we've also got hr we've got finance we've got account managers you know we've got production people so there's a whole set of different job roles within the agency but what you do find is that most people that work here have some kind of passion for creativity in some shape or form so even though their day job might not be as a creative in their spare time they may have some quite creative hobbies or enjoy creative social outings activities and that sort of thing so they're the sorts of things that kind of pull you in I think one of the differences for the younger generation is they can see a vision and the creative output like all the creatives can but how they get there might be different so some of the traditional creatives may have been trained and learnt their discipline in a certain way by following a certain process, for example. And that process has been super successful for them. They've won awards. Clients are very comfortable with that because it's what they know. But then you get not just younger people coming in, but people coming in from different creative disciplines because we've been trying to find creative talent that may not have just come through the traditional route that approach things differently. So they may see the end result, but how they get there may be different. So they may want to just try and test and fail fast and try again in a different way to what maybe some of our traditional creatives may do, because they know there's a client there as well that might not necessarily have the same sort of tolerance for that try, test, fail. Everybody Mm. wants the great creative output at the end, but how we Mm. get there, I think, is a real interesting space for us to unpack a bit further and start to work out how do we really get the both of the traditional ways of doing things with this Mm. modern, almost fearless way of doing things. And that trust must be critical, Elaine, right? That I'm in an environment where it's okay to not get it right first time. Yes, that's right. And I think, you know, really talking to people, building the teams, showing people that their ideas are valid, giving regular feedback, constructive feedback, really recognising ideas coming from anywhere is really important to that trust. And because creativity is, is such a passion for many people here, is how do you help them to really use their creativity in ways that sometimes may not be the traditional way for the job that they're doing, Mm. but there may be other projects that are happening across the agency that they can get involved in. I've got a horrible feeling Chris is going to tell us to be quiet in a minute and try and close up. So I want to get this question in as soon as I can before he does that. I'm really interested to know, we work with lots of clients. Our listeners represent a huge range of, um, hopefully a huge anyway, range of different types of industry. And I'm just wondering, what what do you think are the, I don't know, one or two little nuggets that, that we should all take away from how the creative industry is operating? What do you think is is really key for us to to think about doing differently in perhaps more traditional businesses? I think be brave just because somebody has a different way of doing things or they come from a background that might be a little bit different to the way in which you're used to. If that individual gets your business, is interested in what you're doing, wants to make an impact, wants to make you bigger and greater and has really good learning agility, is open, is curious, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? And then I think the second thing, which we're, which we're learning a lot here too, is when you bring those people in that might be a bit different, how do you nurture them so that when they come in, they don't get organ rejection by the rest of the traditional business as they come in? Because you, you've, you've spotted something in them. You want to do something that nurtures that and encourages it and helps it to bloom so that you can get more people who are also different into your team. So be braver. And then when you're brave, really think about how you can nurture that talent. I really, really love that. And we do have, I've got another, I'm going to extend it by a couple of minutes just so I can ask my question. Because Elaine, when we were speaking previously, and this links actually to what you were just talking about, like people are different, but actually embracing that 
difference embracing diversity is quite a, an important bit. And we had a conversation when we were uh, prepping for this podcast just about passions to you. And you obviously talked about the diversity side. So just to close us out, some thoughts around how you drive greater diversity in the creative industry, because as we spoke about, I know this is a passion of yours. Yeah, it's very much of kind of what I was saying is is looking to different disciplines and and being braver about it. You have to look harder. You know, some of the people that may have found it difficult to flourish in a corporate environment previously may be doing really well on their own. So you've got to think about, well, what are you offering them to? You know, you can see why they'd be great to come and work with you and your teams and help kind of bring us into the future or, or keep up to date with modern trends. But also think about what you can offer them. And sometimes some of that more formal structure and discipline and learning can also be really helpful for them, even if they decide that maybe their career with you is three, four years you know, rather than a lifetime, you can actually do something to contribute to helping them grow as an individual, which will then help them to really unleash their creativity, whether it's with you or somebody else in the future. Always do what you can. Small acts make big impacts. <laughs> you might not receive all the big impacts, but you'll really receive something. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely love that. And what a wonderful way for us to uh, just come to the end of today's podcast. Elaine, this has been amazing. I've really, really Thank enjoyed you. the conversation around kind yeah. of those like differences around the creative industry, but also commonalities, similarities, and um, just getting a bit of your experience from your previous roles as well. And kind of this idea of like, how do you drive leadership within your industry? Really, really fascinating. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's been great to have you, Debbie. Thank you very much. As always, as my co-host in crime, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. It's been great. Of course, you can get this podcast wherever you get this podcast. We are on all the major channels. You can also find out our back catalogue if you go to lacepartners.co.uk forward slash podcast. You can find out all of that. If you go to our insights section, we write blogs, white papers, and a whole variety of different HR topics. If this is not the first time that you've heard this, though, you will have already know that because I say this at the end of every podcast. But from myself, from Elaine, and from Debbie, thank you very much for listening. And hopefully we'll catch you next time on the HR on the offensive podcast. Bye-bye.